welcome our recurring guest, um, our our lovely announcer of the winners last year, Miss Diane Drake, the wonderful screenwriter and teacher extraordinaire. And we just thank you for your time and all that you do for the festival. Um, so I just thank you from the bottom Thanks. of my heart. You're so sweet. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, now, um, I know we've been talking about the writer strike and now it's finally been resolved. So I, I love your takeaway from that. Like, what did you think when you first heard, oh, wow, we are going to strike? Um, you know, I mean, I'll be really honest. I, I mostly speak and teach and consult at this point. I'm not really a working writer in, in a certain sense. And I, to be honest, I kind of never was. I mean, I always worked on spec. You know what I mean? I never had a regular paycheck. I never, I never worked in television for better or worse. I never had that. So, um, but I, I, I have to say because I didn't work in series TV and particularly not streaming, um, when the strike was announced and you started hearing more stories of people's experience, you know, the business has always been tough. It's never been easy to get in. It's never been easy to make a steady living at, but the degree to which it's just become ridiculously difficult now, like where even people who were employed on streaming series had to have second jobs. You know, they were driving Ubers and stuff. I couldn't believe it. It's just, that's just despicable. So I was pleased to see that for once, um, and with obvious good reason because of that, the the TV, we'll, we'll lump streaming with TV, right? The TV streaming writers and the feature writers, of whom there are fewer, um, stuck together. Because in the past, the, you know, it's almost like, you know, from a leverage standpoint, you wouldn't want two separate guilds. But in terms of like the rules and what affects us, it's very, very, very different. And the, there were always more TV writers. And in previous strikes, they were never willing to really hang tough, in my opinion, for very long. You know, certainly not long enough to hold out for anything the feature writers wanted. Um, because they were used to city paychecks. And they were used to having insurance. And they were used to, you know, um, that sort of life. And so I kind of doubted that they would stick together. But I think everybody recognized that this one, you know, this this was for all the marbles. And then you add in AI on top of that. Yeah. And that affects everybody. So, you know, good on, good on the Writers Guild. Good on them for hanging tough on the negotiating committee. I think they did a really good job. Um, yeah, I, d I don't know that many details about the deal. But what I do know, I think it was significant. That was significant progress, you know, and um, hopefully, I mean, I really don't know, but I mean, hopefully from here on out, if you, if you get a regular job on a streaming series, you'll at least be able to just do that. You know, I mean, part of the problem is <clears throat> they're shorter, right? You know, it's maybe a 12 episode season or whatever. And then, and then you're looking for work again. So that's really tough too. And, and then when it comes to the, feature market pretty much all the studios want is ip and and generally you know superheroes yeah so there's there's it's it's not for the faint of heart that's for sure yeah it's it's really crazy and it seems like um you know for this strike like the way i looked at it it's like um two worlds kind of met like you know the ethos of the blue collar like that's it we're not going to take any more versus that glamour that's you know perpetrated to everybody that wants to get in right um so i i was like you know that really impressed upon me that that it's like you know no people get it done you know just yeah. brick by brick no matter what Honestly, and the amount of economic insecurity you live with, you know, and I mean, there's a handful of people that get the vast majority of the work and everybody else is, you know, scrambling. And yeah, it's, it's, I, <laughs> I think, <clears throat> I think getting to your point, I think another good thing about it is it's sort of um, let people know a little bit more about the reality of it, right? Um, it's interesting. This is a bit of a sidetrack, but <clears throat> I was talking to a friend the other day and we were talking about the fact that 
with all the contests out there, you know, there's a gazillion of them now. It's almost like the industry that's built up around the industry is in a way bigger than the industry, right? Yeah. You know, and it kind of reminded me, it's like, it's like, it's like the gold miners, you know, the story about how the people who sold supplies to the gold miners actually made more money oh. than most miners did. Wow. Yeah. Now I haven't heard. money was. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, not that the contests don't help. There's a handful that do if you're able to, you know, make it into the top three, probably. But I think I think people who want to get into the business <coughs> have have dreams of it, but don't really know what they're dealing mm -hmm. with. Think this is somehow going to be a stepping stone, and in my humble opinion, the vast majority of them are not. You know, if if you want to spend your money and you want to you know, have bragging rights because you made the quarterfinals in some contest that nobody's ever heard of, you know, or even some that people have. Um, fine. That's great. Maybe that that gives you the, you know, the impetus to keep going. And that's good. But, you know, there's so many of them. I, I do feel like it's a little exploitative, I have to say. But yeah, yeah. What do I know? <laughs> I, the other night, I have to tell you, I have to tell you the other night. <laughs> I was teaching my class for UCLA and I kind of got onto this subject and, and how tough it can be, you know, <laughs> there's students in my class who I know, I know her from a writer's retreat and she's lovely, but she's like, I think Diane had a few drinks during the break, you know, <laughs> like I was talking a little too freely, I guess, about reality and, and people don't want to hear it. I mean, I get it, you know, and, Maybe I wouldn't want to hear it either, but I think knowledge is power. I think, I think you should avail yourself of, you know, and I'm one person's opinion. You don't have to take my word for it, but do your research, you know, <clears throat> it's easy to do now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that you brought all this up. Actually. I love it because honestly, you know, and, and you know, take from this what you will, but you have YouTube now, right. That could just be, just as powerful, you know, you've shown your, your work, um, you know, like perhaps following the industry is what's giving the industry its power. You know what I mean? If, if you reroute it into, I'm going to do this because I have this vision, I have this forte, you know, why do we need a green light from an outside source? Well, I think that's a good point. I mean, from a certain angle, in a way you don't now, right? But you kind of do if you want to get paid very well, because the vast majority of people throwing stuff up on YouTube are not making that much money unless they're constantly turning out content. Um, and even then. Um, so I think if all you want is to make stuff and throw it up there and have an audience, fantastic. You don't need the middleman. But if you want to get paid, if you want to make a living at it um, and you want to have the wherewithal to, you know, shoot with professional actors and on professional sets and all the rest of it and not be doing it all on a shoestring, the vast majority of people who do develop a following on YouTube, like Issa Rae or, you know, I, I think there's a number of them now. I think the Duplass brothers, maybe. I don't know if they start on YouTube, but I think a little bit. Um you know, when they can get the paying gigs, they take the paying gigs, right? Oh, Even sure. if they try to keep a certain amount of independence and stuff. Um, but I agree with you that it certainly is a way to, you know, if if you can do it, you can do it, right? It's a way to get your work seen and it's a way to at least, you know, expose it to the powers that be. I was talking to a friend the other day, a friend of mine really wants to make a short film and I'm kind of on board with it if we can come up with the right idea. Like, why not? It could be fun. Uh, but I don't, I, I don't want it to be what, <laughs> what a friend of mine used to call daycare for adults. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like it, it means to an end, I feel. I mean, unless we're just doing it for a lark and it costs nothing and why not, you know, but um, what was my point of that? Oh, I know. So I was, I, I was doing some research on short films that had become other things, right. Or it led to other things. And it's kind of interesting. I mean, obviously big, big, big one was South Park. I don't know if you know how that started, but it was in way back when, right? This is like over 20 years ago now, maybe more than that. Um, but uh, so there was no real internet and stuff, but but um, Trey Parker and Matt Stone 
did a very, very, very primitive little South Park, you know, animation, but it's not that different now. It's not like the animation is very sophisticated now, but it was even more primitive and sent it out as a Christmas card. It was a little video that they sent out as a Christmas card. Wow. And the rest of history on that one. Yeah. And then I just watched a, um, a little short, what's it called? It's got a weird name. It's got like a Spanish name. Anyway, it was what became Napoleon Dynamite. And it is that guy, John Hader, and it's shot in black and white. And it's just a quirky little short. You know, it's maybe eight minutes long. He is that character. He's on the bus going to school. He's friends with Pedro. They decide they want to buy a lottery ticket, and but they can't get one because he doesn't look old enough. And then Pedro manages to get one. And oh, because they want to get because the other friend shaved his hair off for some reason. And now he wants a wig. It's all very <laughs> odd and silly and quirky and it's just really interesting that that led to that film you know yeah no a uh, whiplash too i believe whiplash. right I think, I think you're right but i and i haven't watched this short for whiplash i don't think but i do think some of those people like there's a number of them out there that are sort of like another level they're not really done on a shoestring they're not really like they yeah. were already kind of in the game or they already had some money they already had actors I'm sort of there's one for um oh Malcolm's List, which I guess was a, a rom com kind of Jane Austen y. Um and it's very professional looking. Like like it looks like the short was professionally produced and so and then it became a film. So I don't know what the story behind that was. But um yeah, there's varying degrees. What what was interesting to me about the South Park one and um Napoleon Dynamite is they were very bare bones, you know, they were it was just the sensibility. Right. And, yeah. and uh, the new, for whatever reason, you know, the novelty of them at the time. And it's interesting. Yeah. 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 No, it, you know, it's, I guess, the adventure of it too, of putting something out there, you know, mm -hmm. and never know, knowing, you know, where it could lead. But yeah, no, I, I totally know what you're saying too. It's, it's just like, yeah, make something for them to take notice of you, you know? Yeah. 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 I, I wanted to get into your teaching. Oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. Go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> hey, ideally, something that you know you're proud of in and of itself, right? That you that you want out there in the world with your name on it, right? And and that you enjoy making. Um, and there's the rub because as much as like in theory, I like the idea of doing a short. It's not th something I'd ever done. It seems doable and kind of fun. My friend is very gung ho, but you have to have that idea that you really love in order to even begin to do all the work that's involved, even in something short, you know, even in a, a few minutes. Um, and even like I've been watching some that are, they're very simple, you know, a couple people on a park bench, some people in a conference room, whatever. But, you know, something better happen really quickly. <laughs> 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 you know, you you can get about two seconds leeway in terms of people's attention spans now. Yeah. So it's a challenge. We'll see. We'll see what we can come up with. Well, I think you've already overcome the first hurdle because um, I think even in doing a short, like the first thing is like, do I really want to work with this person and see them and have this commitment? Like I have a friend that says, um, she is more selective of working on films with people than of people that she dates, you know? Wow. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> it's true because you're going to spend so much time with them mm -hmm. and yeah, you better all be able to get along. And, you know, especially if you're doing it, you know, pro bono, basically, if you're, if you're getting paid, I mean, whatever, you know, obviously everybody wants to work with people they like and that's fine, but if you're just doing it to do it, you know, and hoping something's going to come of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good bar to have. I think. <laughs> yeah. So you're already over the, the first hurdle. <laughs> I haven't made it yet, but uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Well, I mean, it's funny because yeah, because that's the other thing, like this has yet to happen, but I think, you know, conceivably, one or the other of us could come up with something that they really, really believed in. And maybe the other one doesn't, 
you know, I mean, we'll see. I, I have a feeling that's probably not going to happen, mainly because I'm the one more experienced in the industry. She's not in the industry. <clears throat> so I think she would probably be more inclined to defer to me. She knows I've seen more stuff than she has. Sure. Um, but also because I think we have a somewhat similar sensibility. Although hers is darker than mine. She she would go, <laughs> which is fine, that's fine. I mean, there's probably more of a market for that, but she is a little little more inclined to even, even darker comedy, whatever. So, yeah, we'll see. Sounds intriguing. <laughs> Sounds intriguing. You'll have to keep us posted. I hope so. <laughs> you know, again, in theory, it is. It's just coming up with that idea, coming up with something that you can think you can sustain for even five minutes, you know, and... It's funny, I do have one idea, which I won't bore you with, but I do have one idea that I actually think is kind of interesting, but it's period. So that kind of eliminates it because um, it would have to be in a city, like you would have to see that this person's in a city in the 40s. <clears throat> so that's impossible. Mm -hmm. And it's also, well, I don't know. I wouldn't know where to begin, let's put it that way. And just the costumes and the car. I mean, I don't know. But, but, but also... Maybe, maybe. I mean, it just feels so out of my reach to be able to do that. But the other thing I was going to say, and this is the other thing that would stop me probably even more than that, is it's very dramatic. You know, it's kind of it's kind of heavy, to be honest. And I just feel like, where are we going to go with that? Like, I'm, I'm not going to make, you know, I mean, there's, there's one respect in which it could lead to something because it could sort of be a series about the larger context of this person. But this particular scene... Uh, or, or sequence, I guess, is pretty heavy. It's actually something that happened to my aunt. So, mm. yeah. But I think, I, I do think it's intriguing. I mean, whatever. I got that one in my back pocket, I guess. <laughs> you ever need an actress? I'm there. Okay. <laughs> hey, hey, you have a good luck. You could, it could work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Seriously. Bro. For, you know, just for the sheer joy of doing something else with you. Aww. Yeah, yeah. That's sweet. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, I wanted to ask you too a little bit more about the strike. Um, a friend of mine really said that not only did it help, you know, the writers' guild, but it also was the impetus for the actors' strike. So, you know, and it was really like this in tandem thing. I um I don't know, like. Did you ever see something like this before? Um, I mean, I feel like I did. I feel like in 2008, there were actors out too. I could be wrong about that. Maybe they didn't go out. I know they, they showed up in solidarity of the writer mm -hmm. strike in 2008, but I guess they didn't really strike themselves. Or if they did, it was very quickly resolved. The AI thing kind of brought everybody together, except, uh, of course, the directors who always... Don't get me started. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's just say I wasn't surprised that the director did not show up in droves to support the writers. Let me just say that. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it was very, there was a great deal of solidarity this time. And um, it was a two way street, you know, in terms of actors supporting writers and writers supporting actors. And everybody's sort of, I think, feeling like they maybe weren't quite in the same boat, but they were in the same bay <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, like, like, this is the only river we see. better start yeah. yeah come and see you know yeah yeah no no yeah like you said you hit on it i think big time with the ai it's just scary so scary it's just and still so scary i mean i i really don't know the details of what rules have been put in place i know they tried i mean good on them you know, I, hopefully it'll make it. Easier. It does feel like a freight train just barreling at us, though. You know, I don't I don't really know how you stop it. Um, but I will say um, it does seem to me and this is this is one way that people have tried to curtail it, I guess, <clears throat> is it's it's plagiarism. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's there's no mind coming up with this stuff. It's just combing the Internet for stuff that's already been done. Which, from a certain angle, you could say that all art is sort of, you know, has its pre predecessors, presidents, whatever, yeah, yeah. you know, and is building on what's come before, but not like AI is doing it, right? Because there is no intelligence there that's, you know, inventing. It's just 
throwing things together that have already been done. And so, you know, I do think there's a strong case to be made. I mean, the tricky part is like, how do you separate it out? You know, like, like as a writer working on assignment, you know, I have not used it. I just kind of don't want to go near it, but I'm sort of tempted sometimes. Right. Like, <laughs> like just my curiosity, like, cause I have, well, anyway, I mean, like if you were to say, okay, I want to write this paragraph, but make it sound like Hemingway. Right. Yeah. Or make yeah. it sound like Dickens or make it sound like Jane Austen or whoever. I would be curious to see how that works. I'm sure it would be gibberish from a certain angle, but I bet it would give you a place to start. Oh, definitely. To kind of, you know, and then you could clean it up. And, and I actually, I, from what I can gather, and I could be wrong about this, I don't think they've totally ruled it out for writers to use. But I think there has to be a disclosure about that. And I think it, I think it's more the writer's choice and not the, so yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know enough details about it, but I, I know they didn't entirely shut the door on it because they knew they couldn't. Yeah, yeah. Not Even possible. our house works, Shanaegar and the Terminator couldn't yeah, practically. <laughs> there you go. And if he couldn't, <laughs> so the rest of us mortals have, right? Exactly, exactly. I, I'd love to um, touch on your teaching some more because, like, I would be thrilled, I mean, to be in a classroom that you're heading. Like, what have you, um, like, what have your experiences been like? What has surprised you more? Can you only take your class like if you're a full four-year college student at UCLA or could people just take your class just to? Um, just no, to no, it's open enrollment. I teach through extension. So you got the money, UCLA's got the time. Um, anybody can sign up. And um, I would say, you know, it's funny. When I first started, I taught in person. And then I taught a bit off online, but it was what they call asynchronous. So I would record the lectures and, you know, people would access them whenever <clears throat> and then turn in their homework and all that. And then, you know, with COVID and Zoom, suddenly we could do it in real time and I could interact in real time with people. And I initially thought that when I could go back to teaching in the classroom, I probably would just because, you know, and now I'm just like, no, I don't think so. First of all, it's a pain in the neck to get to UCLA from where I am. Um, but more to the point, one of the things I really do like about teaching online and particularly teaching online in real time is I get students from all over the world. You know, I mean, not so much this last class, although I did have people from all over the country in the last class, but, you know, I had a woman from Saudi Arabia, beautiful woman who was an actress there who had produced, as I understood it, I I think I remember this right. Like the only romantic comedy there. Wow. She, had, she was in the only romantic comedy. And then she was working on a new project that was much different and, and about mental illness and stuff. And um, she was fascinating. And I, I just have had a lot of people like that, people from all over Europe and South America and, and people who, you know, obviously not always, but a, a lot of the time, you know, and, and the age range varies completely. But, um, you know, people who are very accomplished in other areas or are very accomplished in terms of documentaries or whatever and now want to try to write a fictional thing. So it's really nice that way. I really enjoy that about it. And, um, you know, it keeps me kind of current. Like I I just taught a very brief class. It's just kind of a kind of it's called Get Your Story Straight. It's sort of based on my book and. I just try to give people kind of an introduction to things like what a log line is and the three acts of a script and what are the kind of the essential plot points and how you create a hero the audience is going to care about. So I, I touch on a lot of things very briefly in the four weeks, but um, where was I going with that? Um, I don't know. I've lost my train of thought. Uh -huh. it, 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 it's just, um, I guess just that I think people, they're very sweet, you know, they're very appreciative and, um, and interesting. They're interesting to me. Like I learned a lot. Oh, I know what I was going to say. So I have certain movies that I really like to use as teaching tools because I think they illustrate the concepts I'm trying to communicate really well. And a lot of those movies are kind of getting older, right? Like I think Toy Story is brilliant for teaching structure and it's basically a classic now. So, okay, fine. Um, I like to use Iron Man, but Iron Man, you know, it feels current in a way because it's Robert Downey and they're still making Marvel movies, but the original one is getting older. Um, 
And so, and I like to use Tootsie, which is friggin' ancient, <laughs> but again, I think is kind of brilliant. And, and it just works in terms of communicating the concepts I'm trying to cover. But so I, I used three movies and um, I guess it was the last class I saw, I don't know, two classes ago, maybe anyway, last year. I um or earlier this year actually um I changed out the third one to use something current because I just felt like it's starting to feel just too dated and so I added everything everywhere all at once which is a really interesting movie to use because on one hand it's like (laughs) (laughs) it's just like sensory overload and uh, as I heard someone say it's like drinking from a fire hose for two hours right oh that's Um, you wouldn't think it would work so well to teach kind of basic concepts but it actually does it in it, it it and it also and the other two I use I think in my humble opinion are kind of flawless um I think just think they're brilliant and pretty much you know pacing dialogue character development structure you know premise all of this stuff you know turn around you know they're surprising you all of that I think everything everywhere all at once is really brilliant in a number of ways and then for me, falls down in a few ways. And so I'm able to talk about where I feel like it's working and where I feel like it's not working as well. And I think that's helpful too. And again, it's all subjective. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm sure there's plenty of people who thought it was the greatest thing they'd ever seen and there was nothing they would change. But, um, you know, it's just my my two cents on that. So I think that's actually kind of a good thing to to discuss a movie that I feel like has so many interesting things and inventive things and is kind of following the standard structure in a way that is very clever and almost like a magic trick, almost like sleight of hand. And then in other ways, I think that act two could have been cut down a little bit. (laughs) No, that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. No, to have that honest, you know, objective opinion in a subjective field. (laughs) Yeah. And that's one of the things I always try to, you know, impress upon people. It's like, this is all just a matter of opinion. None of this is empirical. It's not math, right? You know, whether you like something or you don't like something, but there's also a certain degree to which like there's a knowledge of the craft of the grammar of the craft that is going to inform your ability to analyze why something's working or not. Right. Like, like I'm not a musician, my family are musicians. I'm not. I can't tell you that something is out of rhythm or out of tune the way people in my family could, but I can tell you it doesn't sound right. Right. You know? I can feel that something's off. So yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's it's been fun. I like it. I like doing it. Wow. Wonderful. I I think we're good. I I I always just love speaking with you and thank you for all the joy and energy and positivity you bring to the festival. Wow, yes. you're so sweet, Karen. It's my Thank pleasure. You. The feeling is mutual. It's always a treat to talk to you. Oh, and um, one of these days, we'll get together in person. In yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Maybe New York, California, or Europe. Or Italy. Or yeah. Italy. Yeah. <laughs> That's a plan. Yeah.